Leadership is one of those topics that tends to rankle me along with strategy, and that's that most people don't really understand it. Uh, first of all, the biggest misconception about leadership is it's not a person. Leadership is an activity. It's an activity to organize people to accomplish a common goal. No leader does it alone. A leader needs a team of people to follow him. The other thing about leadership is that it's not generic. There is no generic leader. Leadership is highly situational. A person who could work very well in one situation might totally flop in another. It doesn't mean that they're not a good leader. It just means that their skills weren't for the right place for the right time. If we look at some of the great leaders in industry, Bob Gal and their different styles. Bob Galvin of Motorola. Actually, he and his son built Motorola up, and then Chris Galvin. <laughs> uh, Chris Galvin, the third one, finally kind of wrecked everything, which just pretty much shows you can only go so far with one family. But what Bob Galvin was, he was a consensus builder. He realized he wasn't the person who was going to come up with solutions, and he would try to get it out of the people who worked for him. Actually, the old Motorola, people had tremendous loyalty to Bob Galvin uh, to the extent they said if Bob Galvin picked up the phone and called them and asked for something, they would hop on a plane, no questions asked. Jack Welch, the chainsaw kind of guy, he caused GE to grow. Jack Welch is a pretty cranky guy. Uh, I was highly critical of Jack Welch in business school. I just said he just basically did portfolio management. Kept the winners, shaped out the losers. That's how he got profits up. But anyway, you need that kind of personality in order to push something really large. Uh, Lou Gerstner uh, revitalized IBM, and he did it by saying, this is who we are. A lot of people thought IBM should be broken up into parts so they could compete better. But all that would have done is just allowed I all the little pieces to get eaten alive. The big thing was to stay together. And what Lou Gerstner did with uh, IBM is he said, look, we're in the technology space. People don't want to do technology. They want other people to do it. So what we need to do is focus on the services business because we offer more aspects than anybody else can. And he was absolutely right. William Ruckelhaus. Um, William Ruckelhaus was once Assistant Attorney General of the United States. And what ended up happening is when Nixon started firing the special prosecutor uh, and the attorney general refused to do it, Nixon fired him, put Ruckelhaus in. Ruckelhaus also refused to fire him, and Ruckelhaus got fired. Later on, he was put in charge of the EPA. And one of the big problems with the pollution is like you have towns. The pollutants are clearly killing people. By the same token, they don't want to kill the business because then everybody in the town will be out of a job. And so William Ruckelhaus used to go into these situations and they expected Washington to tell them what to do and Ruckelhaus wouldn't do that. And then people would get all angry and mad and then once they got past the emotion, they would sit down and figure it out. And Ruckelhaus' secret was that he realized that when you have a lot of stakeholders, you need them to come up with the solution themselves. It needs to be bottoms up. And the reason why is because they have to own it. Uh, George Kane of Abbott Laboratories. Um, for 20 years under George Kane, Abbott Laboratories grew an average of 22% a year. Pretty darn impressive to keep that up for 20 years. But George Kane was a humble man. He was a quiet man, incredibly driven, um, liked to delegate authority, um, also uh, under, came to grips with who Abbott Labs was. Uh, at the time, similar companies to Abbott went under while well, Abbott uh, grew uh, into a billion dollar company. And for those of you who read the book, Good to Great, know about George Kane. The thing is, in most cases, that George Kane will never become CEO. And the reason why is it's about personality. And that's uh, it's the loudest and most uh, uh, the person who uh, attracts the most attention becomes a C, you know, CEO. Now, where does one get authority to lead? And 
your authority either comes from people giving it to you or you force them to do it. Forcing them to do it is they report to you directly or you have some kind of legal agreement. On the other hand, the greatest power of all is when you have respect or you can form relationships with your people. In terms of influencing others, and this is the biggest question that got asked in business school, and I pretty much summed it up. Uh -huh. There are three ways you get people to do, do things for you. Take them out and shoot them. <laughs> and that's that you exert your power over them. And sometimes you need to do this. Like, for example, in one company I was working for, we had a major policy shift and change. Some people were let go. And naturally, huge amounts of change very suddenly gets people very angry, very nervous. And while I was explaining a new strategy, one guy totally lost it. And he started chewing me out in front of everyone. And I just flat out asked him, so are you buying into this? He said, no. I said, fine, you're gone. I fired him on the spot. Uh, yeah, that got everybody <laughs> settled down and kind of quiet. But every once in a while, you just need to go out and shoot people to get their attention. Uh, in the middle of the road, which takes a little more time, is incentives. And that's that incentives are good for short term or medium term, but, sh but incentives aren't a good long term thing. And part of the reason why incentives don't work that well is when you do it too often, it starts to become an entitlement. Like a lot of companies that have profit sharing, it's not about profit sharing anymore. People just expect to get their profit share check. And I've been there before. Uh, not only that, but people will only work for money for so long. And then after a while, it's like, you know, it's just not worth it to me. And so the greatest thing you can do is if you can inspire people, if you can have them buy into your vision because when people will fight for something, fight hard for something, they'll do it because they believe in something. And so this is why Apple employees, for example, why on earth would you put up with a jerk like Steve Jobs? Well, it's because you buy into the vision. You buy into the Apple. I uh, <laughs> buy into the Apple. Uh, the second reason why people will work very hard for each other is they won't fight for a company, but they'll fight for the person next to them. And this is the mentality of soldiers. You know, don't fight for liberty, truth, justice in the American way. Fight for the guy next to you. And so uh, when people feel they're taken care of and rewarded for their work as well, uh, that helps foster inspiration. Uh, these are the nine kinds of CEOs that I've come across uh, in my career. None of them are perfect, <laughs> and a lot of them have severe flaws, but they do have strengths. And this is the lesson about leaders. There is no generic leader who can do everything. And so if you have the appropriate leader with a certain strength, he has to build a team around him. He has to build a team around him uh, who can make up for his weaknesses. So in this case, you really need to know yourself. You know what you can do well, what you could not do well. A good example of that is in, uh, I, I disagree with the way FSC 301 is taught, for example. I don't believe everybody needs to know how to sell. I know myself as a salesman. I am extremely mediocre. I don't like doing it. And the thing is, sales is a skill. And it's a skill that very, very few people are good at. So why on earth would I go out there and try to sell when I could just hire somebody or bring somebody on my team who's actually good at it? And that's the big thing about a startup. You want to bring the best people on board. You don't want to bring on mediocre people or people who are trying to do things that they're not particularly good at, especially when it's an important function like sales. Yes, lesser functions, you can get away with it. You don't need the best janitor in the world. <laughs> but as far as these other things go, you do. Now, in terms of bringing on employees, uh, one thing I always crack up about uh, in uh, career offices, that's what I'm trying to think of, in career placement offices, they always say, here are the 100 questions that you need to know when you're going in for an interview. Well, it's a baloney. Because what it really comes down to is there are three things, it doesn't matter what the job, whether it's university or industry or 
government or whatever, they're looking for three things. One is your skills. Can you actually do the job? Do you fit into their culture? There are different kinds of cultures. There's cultures where they don't want you to speak up. There's cultures where they do want you to speak up. There are cultures that are loose and crazy, and they're counting on you to carry the load. There are cultures that are very regimented. If you don't follow it, you don't fit in. And so they want to know, do you fit into their culture? I once interviewed for a job, and the culture was, your job is to take your boss's job. And it's like, holy cow. I'm interviewing with the Roman Empire. <laughs> uh, but I realized, no, nah, this isn't for me. And finally, do you bring any added value to the table? What extra skills? What is about you that's special that you can bring me that I can't get anywhere else? That's another thing that uh, drives me kind of nuts. And that's that uh, when people come in interview and you ask them, you know, why are you an outstanding question? I mean, a candidate, why should I hire you? And they don't have an answer. You as a manager, uh, yes, in the very beginning when there's only a couple of employees, you can't think about it. But as you grow as an organization, you should be thinking about succession. And good managers have a succession plan in place. They know they have a responsibility to the company, to investors, to employees. And if they got run over by a car tomorrow, would the company be in place to take care of itself? And executives don't like to think about this because it's like, why don't a lot of people talk about writing their will or write their wills? And it's because people don't like to think about the end. People don't like to think about death. Uh, I'm exactly the opposite because I've closed three estates and geez, what a mess. <laughs> uh, and so after seeing how much work actually goes into it, I don't want my wife to go through that. So I have documentation where it tells, it gives her an entire financial plan if anything ever happens to me. Here's where you go get my life insurance, here are my account numbers, everything. And so I give, gave her an entire roadmap of what to do with their finances. And if someone close to you who has a significant financial stake in your life were totally gone tomorrow, you know, do you know their passwords and things like that? And the same thing applies to your job as a manager. And that's if something happens to you. Or how badly are you going to hurt the company? In terms of thinking about succession, what are the things you have to think about? Well, first of all, what's your strategic roadmap? What is it that your company's going to do? Because based on where the company's going, you could start thinking about the skills the company needs. Uh, what kind of talents do you need? Arthur Rock, uh, legendary venture capitalist, when he was form helping to form Intel, he said, in order, I want Bob Noyce, Gordon Moore, and Andy Grove. He specifically picked the order of CEOs that uh, eventually drove Intel into one of the biggest, semicond well, the biggest semiconductor manufacturer in the world. What people do you think you want to hold on to? Make them feel like they're part of the process. And how will I make this as seamless as possible? These are the things you think about when you think about succession. And so uh, a lot of companies tend to fail at this because they don't think ahead. It's not defined and they're not quite sure how they want to transition and they, they're slow to act. And uh, that's a big issue. In the part three, we'll start to talk about cashing in. Yes, we're going to talk about harvesting.